Coming up, why no Iditarod is alike. The strategy is an interesting question because it's ever evolving. Even for Mitch and Dallas Seavey, last year's top two finishers. I feel like the team has the ability to win, but I feel like there's probably 10 teams in this year's race that have the ability to win. I feel like it's been slipped in and out of my grasp a couple times. Ahead on Frontiers, what makes the Iditarod such a hard race to predict, but so much fun to follow. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by your local Alaska Toyota dealers. Toyota, let's go places. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. Tomorrow, Iditarod mushers take on a personal frontier. This year, they head out from Fairbanks and follow the northern route to Nome. John Thane caught up with two of the top mushers who, as father and son, are both family as well as fierce competitors. All year long, Mitch Seavey has been preparing for another Iditarod, maintaining his 140 dog kennel and putting hundreds of miles on his A-team, an elite group of 16 athletes. It's a team that's gonna be really hard to beat. <laughs> Mitch tries not to worry about the factors of the race he can't control, the competition, which certainly includes his own son, Dallas Seavey. So for my dad, it's, it is tough racing somebody you really care about but I don't back off. You know, we want nothing but the best for each other. Unfortunately, only one can win. Last year, Mitch's team was going strong, ahead of Dallas, sometimes by hours at a time. But by Koyuk, father and son were neck and neck. When I left Koyuk, instead of being like, yes, my, my move worked, you know, we've got a lead, I've got this thing. The, the emotions I was feeling was, um, I, I felt, I felt what he was feeling, and that was that, that disappointment, that everything just shifted. And uh, I'm a tough macho guy, of course, um, but there may have been a, a couple tears. <laughs> but his competitive side took over, and Dallas went on to win the race, with Mitch settling in for a bittersweet second for the second year in a row. Well, I, I think it's even better than, than myself having a lot of wins. Um, I'm super proud of him, but I'll tell you what, at least I'm going to keep him honest. If nobody else is going to push him, I'm going to push him. And if I can catch him, I'm going to beat him. In Mitch's favor this year is simply having snow. Feels good to be back in the wildlife refuge. For the first time in three seasons, he can mush right from his backyard. But Dallas has a trick up his sleeve this year, too. I've always enjoyed making dog sleds. A completely redesigned Kevlar and carbon fiber exoskeleton dog sled of the future in all black. We haven't really come up with a name for it yet. Open up the side doors, there's a space to carry dogs. He can carry four, resting his team while on the go. The day I was mushing along and uh, had my roof opened up and I was chatting with two of my boys back there. But it's a design he's had to guard closely from family spies. My, my dad's kennel and his whole team, they're the Russians, you know, and we're always worried about them stealing our secrets. We're ultra competitive. We don't tell every, each other everything. My dad was coming over, so I, uh, took it up and put it in the barn. <laughs> if I ask Dallas a question and he answers me, there's a good chance it's not the whole truth. And, and that's fair because in racing, you know, there's questions you shouldn't ask. This father and son might share a trail, but they're on their own path. For Frontiers, I'm John Thane. Dallas CV says that there are about 10 mushers this year who could be the first into Nome. Up next, we'll check in with one of those. I got a team of Navy SEALs. Jeff King is part of an elite group of racers with a shot at a fifth win. How he keeps his eyes on the prize. And like Jeff King, Ali Zirkel has moved on from last year's brush with terror on the trail how that hasn't stopped her from wanting to give back. Would you be into doing a hot stone massage? A uh, hot what? At least the car is quiet. Snowboarding is better than skiing. I completely disagree. 
The One for Everyone sales event is going on now, and we have one for you. During Toyota's One for Everyone sales event, you can get 0% APR financing on the adventurous RAV4 and 10 other select models. Offer ends April 3rd. For great deals on other Toyotas, visit toyota.com. Toyota, let's go places. Today, the impossible is happening. Thanks to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thousands with blood cancer are coming home to live a normal life. When you support LLS, you not only save lives, you accelerate the most pioneering cancer research of our time. Help us turn someday into today. Join us. You don't have to live in a big city to be a foster parent. You don't have to have a big house, a fancy car, or lots of money. What you need is a home. What you need is a heart that can open to a child who needs you. Won't you become a foster parent today? A child is waiting. Call 1-800-478-7307. Every day something's different and I get really excited to report on stories in Alaska. I cover these stories. I need to be out there. I need to be experiencing all this stuff. I need to know. And Alaska is so big that you really have to get out there because I think it's really important to meet people and cover their communities. There's just so many stories here that I could do a story for every day for the rest of my life and still have something new to tell in Alaska. Every year, there is a new race to be run, new challenges to face. As a four-time winner of the Iditarod, Jeff King knows well how the race can humble the most celebrated musher at times. And as John Thane shows us, he is yet another chance to become king of comebacks. You don't need to hide your pride I got a, when you're a member of Jeff King's dog team. Team of Navy SEALs. Come here. It's a relationship that works both ways, and the rules are simple. It's just no fun to me if, if they don't like me and I don't like them. Today's training run will take them around Jeff's backyard, Denali National Park. He moved here in 1975. Mushing dogs was always part of the plan, and in 1981, he ran his first Iditarod. Oh, the first race was such an adventure. Since then, Jeff was a constant in the last great race, winning four in the span of 14 years. But that fifth win has been elusive. I feel like it's been slipped in and out of my grasp a couple times in the last few years. Never closer than in 2014, when Jeff was in position to win, only to get pinned down by a storm just hours from the finish line. He keeps blowing us off the trail and the dogs need a rest. But last year may have been the most painful. Outside Nulato, in the middle of the night, his team was hit by a snow machiner under the influence of alcohol. Uh, one of my dogs was killed almost on impact and several others were injured. The incident attracted worldwide attention, but Jeff stayed in the race and rode to Nome for an emotional ninth place finish. Yes. It's probably the closest call I've had with a drunk driver that could have killed me and uh, the whole team. And now he's back. <laughs> it's um, contagious. It's, it's uh, a form of an addictive, mind-altering drug to see the dogs excited and know that they're counting on you. A lifetime of living the Alaska dream that he doesn't take for granted. Relax. On a clear day or a full moon, um, shake my head in disbelief that, you know, I could be stuck in traffic on an LA freeway um, had I zigged instead of zagged uh, somewhere in my early 20s. Um, who knows what brings us where we end up, but I certainly hope uh, I can continue to be as very grateful for the good fortune that I have had. Gee! Gee! Is there one more pot of gold in his 27th Iditarod? Regardless of where he finishes, Jeff King is in a good place. For Frontiers, I'm John Thane. The drunken snow machine driver who terrorized Jeff King and Ali Zirkel during last year's Iditarod was scheduled to be brought back to jail Sunday. Arnold Damoski, who is 27, is serving part of his sentence in Fairbanks with electronic monitoring. But one of the conditions of his release is that he not be 
anywhere near where the Iditarod passes through. Damoski will be released from the Fairbanks Correctional Center on Tuesday after all the racers have left town. Well, not only is Jeff King back in the race after such a painful setback, but so is Ali Zirkel, who joins us now. Well, Ali, there has to be quite a bit of healing uh, necessary to take place after an experience like that for both you and your team. I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people in the world um, have things happen to them that they don't expect. A lot of Alaskans have had issues, you know, everyone. And so I think a lot of people could understand that it took me a long time to to come back to where I am now. And But I feel like I'm there. I so really what do. did you tell Damoski at his sentencing? Well, you know... Um, I guess basically what I think, I told him what I think. I told him that, that life is valuable, that everyone's life is valuable, that your life is valuable, that um, everyone's life is valuable and his life is valuable and that it was a crime, the biggest crime in the world to, to basically, you know, make my life seem like it was not worthy. And um, that was what I wanted to get across more than anything because that's what he made me feel like. So now you have kind of gone on a new journey or, or picked up part of an old journey, and that's yeah. working with kids. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like that the Iditarod, you know, we travel through all these communities out there. I mean, and it is such a plus that they allow us to travel through their villages, use their cabins, their trails. I mean, and... And they approach us with smiles and hugs and good wishes. And so how do, how do we give back to that, you know, as, as I did around mushrooms and as Alaskans? And for a number of years, you know, when you come into a tiny little village on the western coast of Gullivan and there's 25 kids standing there smiling and waving and wanting to give you a hug, then it's, it's the kids that that really I want to give back to. That stay with you. So They do. And I understand that you have uh, become involved in a project called Lead On. Yeah, that's kind of neat, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's, it's kind of doggy. But basically what it is is it's a conference that's been happening for actually quite a few years. And I've only been to this last year's conference. And what they're doing is they're bringing kids in from, from villages in Alaska and basically creating programs, two and three days of programs where kids can learn so much about themselves, empowering themselves, um, learning basically social programs and, and how they can just improve themselves from the ground up. And you know as well as me is there's, there's a lot of programs for that out there for kids in Anchorage, in Fairbanks, in Juneau, in our main, you know, main population centers in Alaska. But real Alaskans, like Iditarod Trail Villages Alaskans, where are those kids going to go? So I think this is a good place. I understand that you've teamed up with your sponsor, Matson, to I have. bring some of these kids to Anchorage. And we have a number <laughs> on the screen uh, that can show you how if you want to donate to yeah. this. But why do you think it's so important that, that we make this effort to target the rural kids? Well, because rural kids have, a, have just as much of a right to have all the great resources that everyone else does, and especially in this world today when, my goodness, if I can run a dog team from Anchorage to Nome in nine days, eight and a half maybe this year, then why can't we have programs where kids can come from, from, from Ruby, from Shaktulik, from Shagaluk, from Nilato? Why can't we have kids come from there, come into Anchorage and just, you know, feel, empower themselves, feel better about themselves, and then go back to those villages um, and live the life that, that they are able to. Now, as you go on the trail, you'll kind of carry this new banner being a spokesperson for the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. I hope to. I mean, of course, I'll be racing, number one. Top priority. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, throughout my years, this will be, be I did ride number 17 for me. So I, I'll admit to you that, you know, racing is the number one priority, but... I'm a people person. I always have I remember have when you won the quest, you were kind of this bright, young, fresh I used to be young? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're <laughs> all as young as we feel, right? But, but, but now you have assumed the mantle of the veteran. I mean, you've won. Isn't that crazy? You've, you know, you've finished in the top five over the last five years. Yeah. You've come in second twice. Three times. Or three times. So here you are. What's it going to take for you to, to come in first to know? My goodness, I guess a swift kick in the fanny or something. Um, no, <laughs> I, uh, I can, 
I can tell you that honestly, and I can tell you and every, every Alaskan, <clears throat> that every single year when I run the Iditarod, um, I, am, I am motivated not only by my passion and um, what I've been doing for so many years and my team, who uh, has agreed to take me another thousand miles, so that's good. But I'm motivated by the fact that, that we as Alaskans have been you know, part of this dog mushing culture for so many years. And when you get out there and you think it's tough out there and you're striving to win and do better, you think back to 100 years ago. And you think back to people on the Yukon and the Kaikuk River who, I mean, my goodness, it wasn't their, their choice to go out there and race through a blizzard and try to beat Jeff King or Dallas or Martin or something like that. They were doing that for their lives, for their livelihoods. And so when you think about it that way and you think, hey, I'm the one who signed up for this race. I'm the one who's out here pushing it. But there's a lot of tougher people out there than me. There have been and there will be. But and so, what are you going to do different this uh -oh. year? Or will you do anything different this well, year? Well, my goodness. Um, I think the, the one thing that I will bring with me um, that I guess I've brought for a number of years, but I think I feel it heavier on my shoulders, is the well wishings, um, the prayers, the thoughts, the hopes, and the hugs of so many people who have reached out to me over the last year after what happened. And um, I think that's just going to lift me down the trail. All righty. Well, we're looking forward. Maybe another woman into Nome oh, first, first in a long right. time. I'll give it my best shot. All right. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, I know you will. <laughs> well, when we come back, why each Iditarod is like this puzzle with new and different pieces every year. Dave Goldman joins us to sort out those pieces and help us see what might take shape. I just want cremation. No hidden costs, no add-ons. Cremation is much more affordable. Dignified, ecological. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Cremation sure makes a lot of sense. The Cremation Society of Alaska is now serving families in Anchorage and in the Valley. And we are always on the web at alaskacremation.com. Call us today at 277-2777 or in the Valley, 373-8627. Join Beans Cafe in the Children's Lunchbox at the Empty Bowl Project, Saturday, March 11th at the Denina Center. Choose and keep a unique handcrafted bowl and enjoy delicious soup and cornbread prepared by wonderful chefs. Live music, silent auction, and interactive kids zone. Demonstrations from artists and more. Thanks to sponsors BP, KTVA, and many others, all proceeds will go towards feeding the hungry in our community. Tickets available at beanscafe.org. All my life I've been in the outdoors. I remember being a kid when I was 12 years old, studying water temperatures off New Zealand to see if that was going to turn into a tropical storm, which will turn into a hurricane, and what way is the jet stream going to push it out in the Pacific? Does that mean Southern California is going to get monster waves? I was a windsurfer, and I had to study the weather when I was in my early 20s doing my windsurfing. And I realized I've been practicing this all my life, and finally I, did, I got smart, and I realized this is what you'll do. What is health? It's more than a number on the scale. It's in the water we drink and the air we breathe. It's reflected in our jobs, our climate, and our community. Our health is holistic. Our health care should be the same. At ANTHC, we're providing clean water and sanitation around the state. We're working in partnership to make homes safer, health care treatment smarter, and fulfill our vision that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. As the Iditarod heads into its 45th year, each race never fails to surprise us in some way. And KTVA's Dave Goldman joins us now to help us identify some of the variables in this year's race. But this is number four for you. So what mm -hmm. have you learned over the last three years seeing this race close at hand? Uh, that it's like covering any other sport. You'll have the game part of it, but then there's going to be some storyline that's thrown in there that you don't expect, that you can try and predict and never comes through. Last year was obviously was Nilotto and them going through the water and things along those lines, but those are the, those intricacies in between the actual athletic part of it is what, what makes it so well, much fun. Well, we're going out of Fairbanks yeah. this year. Mm -hmm. That's a little different. Yep. It's, uh, it's a little different. Unfortunately, it's becoming more commonplace. It's like old hat for them now because it's the second in three years, and uh, they had one more some time ago, but that's Mother Nature. But 
I think mushers, you know, being as adaptable as they are and their teams being as adaptable as they are, they're, they're just going to work with it. But that yeah. trail, how does it differ from the normal route? Oh, it's a big difference because obviously the traditional Iditarod Trail, which is, you know, Dalzell Gorge and Rainy Pass, which is, again, what, why they're, they're having to reevaluate and reroute it, um, it's completely different. It's, it's more like the Yukon Quest Trail, which is longer and flatter and potentially colder and windier. So that, that changes the dynamic for the, for the mushers and their teams because there, there isn't as much action. So who do you think might have the advantage there, the, the, the <sighs> team that maybe deals with flat trails? Yeah, or? flat trails, wind. I think people who, are, who have done well, for instance, a Jesse, and we'll talk about more, a Jesse Royer, people who can go long and, and flat for long periods of time. If you've done well at the Yukon Quest, then this is the type of trail that you can obviously, and you can certainly But work some with. people like the CVs. Well, yeah. I <laughs> Over mean, the last five years, they've done well. <laughs> man, the CVs can go through Manhattan through a traffic jam, I think. Those guys are terrific. Look at that. And, and why not? Um, of course, you know, when this happens, everybody yeah. wants uh, to see someone new mm -hmm. uh, come into Nome first. But, you know, we, we've seen uh, Dallas having set a couple of records for speed yeah. and being the youngest to win it one but, year. Sure. But you know what, that, that means that the sport's arriving. When you see people, uh, like you see when people are getting tired of the Patriots winning or Tiger Woods winning or, or a dominant team in, in, a, uh, in, in one of the more well-known sports, when you see that happening in Iditarod, people saying, oh, I'm tired of the Seas, let's get someone else in there. That means that's Well, we've had yeah. the multiple winners up yeah. on the screen. And mm -hmm. so what everybody's wondering is, can any one of those mushers with four wins break into the Rick Swenson Club of Five, which is now a club of one. Which is still a club of one, but it's, it's hanging on there. Uh, Dallas Seavey, Dallas what are the, the odds? Guy. Well, he's, he's, he's the favorite. I mean, you know, come on, look at what he's done. You saw the pieces for John and, and what he's done. John he's, Thane's he's always able to He's always able to find a way, comes back, takes over, takes dad or whoever it is. He is able to adapt, and right now he's the best in the business. Don't count out Jeff King. Jeff, although he says, well, it might have passed me by, He's a sly fox, and nobody's nobody believes that for one minute. So, who are you watching out for on the trail? Well, obviously, you have to go with Dallas. I mean, that's that's first and foremost. But I wouldn't count out King, and I think Allie, you know, has a very good team. You know, her husband Alan Moore ran the Yukon Quest. They are a team, and of course, uh, he runs the, the dogs, and then they pick that litter, if you will, and that's the group that Allie goes with. And he had a good run on the Quest, and of course, she's been in it right there, uh, very you know, very closely as well. I think if you're looking for a dark horse, Jessie Royer is somebody to keep an eye on. She always seems to be right there. She's done this thing 14 times. She's got five top tens and three top tens in the last five years. Very quiet and unassuming. So for as much uh, attention as Allie gets or King, Jessie Royer, the opposite way. And she's happy about that, too. She's happy to just go about her business. Well, one of the interesting things about a race like the Iditarod is age doesn't necessarily matter. Mm -hmm. You have the strength and vigor of youth, but the wisdom of experience. You know, And we see that between Dallas and his father, who's twice as old, almost, as he is. Decision-making here. I mean, you have to have the horses, or in this case, the dogs, if you will. Um, but the decision-making, the course management, when to, when to rest, when not to rest, when to push, when not to push, do I try and get through the storm? All of that. And there's really no substitute for experience. And Dallas, one of the reasons he's so successful is that it's a mushing family. Three generations. First it was Dan, then Mitch, then Dallas. He grew up watching Dan and And they Grandpa. have a whole lot of yeah. dogs between them. Of course that. So, so it's no surprise that they start out the first three, four days and everyone gets excited. Oh, maybe such and such can make a run. But then it then the cream rises to the top, and that's why you always see Allie and Jeff and Mitch and Martin and the same names get up there. Well, one of the things that, yeah. that is always amusing is the different things that the mushers try out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Martin Boozer for a while had sales he was experimenting with, you know, and you hear Dallas talking about this top secret sled he's mm -hmm. rolling out in this Iditarod. And, of course, I have to share this with folks. Here's <laughs> what Jeff King has come up with. Let's take a look at this. I have no... Uh... Shame and telling you I'm sick of being cold when I don't need to be. The second time I used And for many years, it frustrated me that my sleeping bag was in the sled while I was riding it and I was cold and I wished I could use my sleeping bag as a coat. And so I designed a sleeping bag that is a coat. <laughs> I can throw my arms to the inside quite easily. You need one of those. Oh, Dave. yeah. We could use one of those. <laughs> it looks like one of those sumo guys that they do in between innings of the baseball game, those sumo wrestlers. That thing is great. 
So what are you looking <laughs> forward to on the trail seeing this year? I know you're going to bring us some of those moments like this. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Knock, knock, we have a, a good clean race, nothing crazy, no nulatos, please, nothing like, like that. Um, but, but a good, fun, clean race, some exciting moments, some good, positive moments. That's the thing for me is, is watching the, the excitement of the competition, but the positive energy that the mushers bring. We heard Allie discussing it and going through some of the villages and the towns. But even the mushers code, I always get such a, a good feeling when you hear about mushers helping mushers. And, and that, for me, I think is one of the best things on the trail. When you get these stories of such and such stopped their race to help him or her because they needed it. And that's what you're supposed to do. And that's kind of yeah. the spirit of the idea, and, right? And I, 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 you know, and you don't see that very often in an athletic competition, but you well, do One here. of the things, too, is every race has some kind of innovation, some yeah. new twist that people learn. What do you think that this race holds? Uh, to be honest, I think, it, I think it's to be determined because you've got a little bit of everything because the snow is very, very deep out there. Um, but, of course, you've got the wind. So I think a lot of these mushers who are, are thinking, perhaps I'm going to try X, Y, and Z with Dalzell Gorge, they may have to change their strategies just a little bit, you know, especially with that. The, the, the weather always at some point plays a factor. That's the one thing is, is never turn your back on Mother Nature. Never. Now, what's it like to see these guys close at hand and gals? You know what? They, they are who they are really here. That's the thing about mushers, which is so refreshing, is that there's not a lot of airs, you know, they, because, again, these are, these are, these are folks who, who clean up after their dogs after they make a mess. So <laughs> there's not a lot of ego. There is ego, but to, to one point, they're all grounded. And, yes, there's a, there's a point when they are competing, but they are who they are. And it's well, thanks fun. for bringing us the sights and sounds of this amazing race. Thank you. My pleasure. Dave Goldman. Well, the race restarts Monday at 11 a.m. in Fairbanks, and you can find live coverage on Channel 907 and Iditarod.com. Well, if Dave's preview hasn't gotten you primed for this year's Iditarod, this song will. We'll leave you with Hobo Jim's I Did, I Did, I Did the Iditarod Trail. Now, this is Hobo Jim's 45th year singing and writing songs in a Alaska, which coincides with the 45th running of the race. Well, thank you for being part of our armchair mushing session. We'll see you next week. We'll give me a team and a good lead dog and a sled that's built so fine. And let me race those miles to know 1049. Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell my tale. I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did the right trail. Well, the race it won't be easy for the masters of the trail. And some of them will make it and some of them will fail. But just to run that race takes a tough and a hardy breed. And a lot of work done by the dogs that run across snow with a whistle and speed. We'll give me a team and a good lead dog and a sled that's built so fine. And let me race those miles to know 1049. Then when I get back to my home, hey, I can tell my tale. I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did the right trail.